So this is a talk called Open Sourcing Mental Illness. When I proposed it, it was about open sourcing depression, but I have more than one mental illness, so I felt like I had to expand that a little bit. Um, uh, but I kind of wanted to talk about the background for this and why I started doing it. Um, about a year ago, I, uh, I did a, an episode of a podcast that um, I do with a friend of mine, Chris Harchis, uh, and we just talk about it's develop, open source developer stuff. Um, we talk a lot about PHP and some Python stuff, a lot of JavaScript stuff, and he's really into testing, so he talks about a lot of testing stuff while I like, mute myself and fall asleep and stuff like that. Um, he, uh, he'll think that's funny. And uh, I, uh, but I, I had this really poor experience at a, at a conference last year. And it wasn't the fault of the conference. It was, um, I had a sort of a three or four th different things went wrong. Uh, but the a big thing is a, a couple things I have. Like I have sleep apnea, so I have to have a CPAP. To, I have to use that basically to sleep or my brain doesn't get enough oxygen and I don't sleep right and you're miserable all the time because you're very tired and feel like shit all the time. And I also forgot to take some of them, uh, forgot to bring some of the medication I take uh, that I have to take every day. And some of that stuff, if you don't take it like within a 24 hour period, you start feeling really messed up because uh, half-life is really bad. So. Um, it kind of depends. Some meds you can kind of just cut off and it's not really a big deal. Those, it wasn't. So I felt like shit and I didn't get enough sleep and when I don't get enough sleep I got sick and it was a really, really bad situation. All those things kind of uh, triggered a lot of reactions in me with stuff that I've been dealing with for a long time, really my whole life. Um, but I talked about it on this podcast and just took this hour to say, hey, we're not going to talk about... Um, I asked Chris, I was like, and we're not going to talk about, uh, you know, stupid PHP stuff and make jokes about Ruby and stuff like that. But we're going we're gonna, to um, do, uh, I want to talk about this, you know, the struggles I've had with mental illness. And he was like, okay, that doesn't sound very funny, but all right. And, um, <laughs> but, uh, so, uh, but he was really game for it. And uh, so we did it and put it out. And we got this massive response, far more than any other uh, episode we've done. Um, so I don't know, maybe I should have turned the whole thing into a mental illness podcast, but, um, but uh, we just got this huge response from, from people, I, and things I kept hearing from people uh, were about, uh, I guess a couple things. One, I didn't understand what it was like. And two, uh, nobody has ever, I, I have problems like this, and I'm afraid to talk to anybody about it, even in my own family, even say my wife or my husband, or, uh, and nobody knows except for maybe these one or two people, and it, I struggle with it constantly, and nobody else knows about what I'm going through. And I kept hearing those kinds of things, and I struggled for a long time to figure out what to do with this, because I felt like I really kind of touched on something. And so, um, I'm kind of lazy too, so I didn't want to do anything that involved a lot of work, I guess. But no, I, 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 you know, I thought about things like, well, maybe I should try an online community or stuff like that, but that's not, I'm not, that's not my thing. Other people are better at that than I am. But I kind of decided after a couple of months, I was like, maybe I just need to keep talking about this. And so that's what I'm doing. And this is the second time I'm giving this talk. First time I was at um, PHP Tech 2013, um, about a month ago, I guess. And um, it's basically the same talk, but there's a little bit different. Oh, God, no, no, I live in Indiana. No, <laughs> no. <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> um, but... Uh, no, yeah, we'll, we'll, I, I can't go off on that tangent. We'll run out of time. Um, uh, but yeah, uh, so that's, that's kind of how this got started, was, was, was doing this. And so I booked a bunch of more than I'm comfortable with traveling around to talk about this. And this is one of those places. That I would have gone to Open Source Bridge anyway because I love this conference. But I'm really glad I got to give this here because this is a really great conference. And I hope it helps. So. Um, so who am I? I uh, well, my name is Ed Finkler. I guess that said it on the previous slide. Um, I'm a dad. I have a son. Um, I'm a husband, and uh, I'm a developer type. And every once in a while, I do music and stuff like that. And I collect vintage console games and stuff like that. Kind of a big nerd about a lot of things. Um, but I also have a mental illness, or, or you know, a couple really, um, at least a couple. Um, but I'm just here as a person. I want to say. Uh, I'm not a doctor and I'm not a psychologist. I'm not a licensed therapist. No one has given me a degree in this stuff. This is all just my personal experience. And so take it as you will. I think 
people sometimes take that kind of stuff too seriously, like I'm some kind of freaking expert about your problems. I, you know, I don't know, I can only talk about me. But what I found is that some of the stuff is, seems like it's applicable and even just talking about it is, I think seems to help. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm really here to talk about what it's like to have uh, a mental illness and to deal with that on a long term, for me, a lifelong basis. Um, but from my perspective as a developer and as a, you know, a parent, as a spouse, uh, and uh, like I said, a gigantic nerd. Um, so my diagnoses uh, are basically this. Um, I generalize anxiety disorder, which basically means that I worry about shit all the time uh, for no good reason. Um, or stuff like I have way more anxiety about stuff than would seem like it normal. Um, I worry about stuff that other people often say like, well, what's, I don't know why that's a big deal. Or maybe they'll have sort of a mild anxiety about it, but I will have an extreme anxiety about it. Um, so, uh, and, and, and part of that is, that goes into that, and I've, I, it's, I, the anxiety stuff has really kind of come on as I've gotten older, um, and I think been more pronounced. Um, uh, when I was 13, I was diagnosed as, dep as, I guess, clinically depressed, whatever the word is for that, and, and depression is certainly a part of that. Um, uh, about of the generalized anxiety disorder. Um, I also mostly diagnosed as adult ADD. Um, I wasn't diagnosed as that until I was 27 and it explains a lot about what school was like for me. Um, uh, I went to uh, private high school. Uh, it was a multi-denominational Christian high school and I had in my class, which is a very small class, it was a total of like 25 people. Um, I, I had like the third worst GPA and the third best SAT scores. Um, so uh, I don't know. So I'm good at some things, but particularly if it's something I'm not interested in, I don't, I particularly, it's very hard for me to kind of stay focused on it and to do it. And um, without medication, it'll be like, I'll go like a week and a half without getting shit done. It's just like, I'll just go through my feed reader for like days on end instead of actually, uh, you know, doing anything. Um, now with medication, I might do that for a couple hours <laughs> and, and then actually maybe get a little work done. Um, so those are the two major things that I have to, I, 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 I deal with. Um, I want to talk about some of the medications I take. Um, I should get into that I don't think, I really don't think medications are some kind of magic pill. Um, I don't think that there's some kind of magic and I, I think that too many people rely purely on medication uh, to treat these kinds of issues. but. I want to talk about what I do take because I think there's a lot of stigma about it. Um, and every day I have to take these things. Um, uh, so I take Lexapro, uh, which is uh, a pretty, it's relatively recent in the line of SSRIs, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. Um, so Prozac was the first one that got on the market. Um, and uh, SSRIs, basically what they do is um, they, they keep serotonin from being reabsorbed into the body. And um, uh, I think the layman's explanation, which is all I could give you, is that serotonin somehow keeps your mood from being totally shitty. <laughs> and it's somehow related to that. And it's interesting, a lot, of, a lot of drugs and the way that they'll talk about how people uh, use them, it, or, or stuff that's on the market and given to people, you know, passes through the FDA in America or whatever, it, it, they'll say, um, well, they thought that this medication, or that this particular chemical has something to do with this, so they tried giving the pill to some people and it looked like it worked okay and helped them. So that's it. Like the understanding of how these kinds of things work is really, really low. And that's one of the reasons why I particularly say uh, that you shouldn't just rely on medication or you should try different things or stuff like that. But the Lexapro is a, a, a common thing that you'll get. Uh, other things like Selexas and other SSRI, you'll commonly be prescribed. Um, but it's, 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 it's given for depression, uh, primarily. Um, difference between it and, uh, say, Prozac is that it generally has less side effects. Um, so that's, like, as they've iteratively tried different things, they'll make very minor changes to it, and it will, say, maybe slightly reduce side effects or stuff like that. Um, I also take Boost Bar, which is, it's used for a couple different things, and I, know, I can't, I don't know, man, I just take it. I don't know what it does. Um, but... Uh, <laughs> It's it, it, for, uh, for a few different things. Uh, it's, it's used to treat anxiety, and also it seems to help 
it seems to basically increase the effectiveness of SSRIs as well. And so if you take it in combination, it seems to help that. So I started taking Boost Bar because I was having lots of anxiety issues, and we didn't want to just keep giving me tranquilizers, which I'll get to in a second. Um, Stratera is something that I take uh, for my adult ADD. And Stratera is, I believe, the only thing, at least in the US market, that's been approved to treat ADD in children or adults that is not an amphetamine. Um, so it's good for people who either didn't respond to amphetamines or don't like taking amphetamine every day. And I, it was awesome the first couple days I took amphetamines. Um, it was great. It's like I, I could talk really fast. I'm even like faster than I am now. And uh, it, it, it's, well, it's pretty much like cocaine. Um, it's, uh, and you didn't have to eat, and it was like, man, everything's awesome. But if you do it every, you take the same dose for like a month, all, you, all I felt like was I was just anxious all the time. Um, and it didn't, I don't know, man, it just didn't work for me. Other people have different reactions. So um, I take Stratera because the, the, the stuff I was taking uh, wasn't really working out. Um, and I think it helps some. Um, and then the other thing I take is clonopin, which I kind of take as an as-needed basis. It's a tranquilizer. Um, it would be similar. Uh, the, the, the clonopin is a commercial name. It's called clonazepam. It's a generic. Um, if you've heard of, like, say, Xanax, it's, it's similar to that. I've taken Xanax, too. Uh, for me, clonopin kind of works better because it's, <laughs> it sounds like I'm talking about, well, I am talking about drugs. Uh, <laughs> I, Clonopin is more of a smooth ride and goes for a while. And Xanax, um, Xanax is like in 10 minutes, you'll be like, fuck, everything's fine, man. This is great. Um, but in like three hours, at least for me, it drops off. And it's, I, it's not as good an experience. So I would, like, clonopin isn't, it takes a little while to kick in. And so, like, if I was having a severe panic attack, clonopin was not really the thing I'd probably take. But if I was kind of having, like, I knew I was going to have a stressful day or something like that, I would, like, the clomp is kind of better for me. So I really, I do have a Xanax prescription, but I try not to take it because of that. Also, you're not supposed to mix them because uh, if you take clomp and Xanax, some people just stop breathing. So don't do that. Um, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, don't do that. Um, so I, I, I guess I want to talk about what it's like, um, what it's like to have a mental illness. And, and for me... I think one of the strongest things I have is that this talk about this intensity of emotion. Um, and it's emotions of, of different kinds. But I, the thing I always think of, especially if I get really frustrated with something and I, get, I really kind of lose it, and some people talk about seeing red or something like that. Um, if you ever saw Kill Bill and there's these parts where it starts playing this song, I can't remember how the song goes, but it's like it's... And there's some focus on her eyes, she's like... Like that, yeah. Yeah, that's right. It's from Iron Sides. That's right. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I don't have any. I don't really have sound hooked up, but just imagine that. Um, you kind of you kind of feel that way. Um, and I, the thing that gets hard about it is that for me is that um, it comes on kind of like a wave, where you know, and it's it's hard to explain to people where. Uh, they're just kind of like, dude, just calm down. And it's like, I, I literally can't, I can't stop myself from feeling this way. I can't stop the emotion from coming. It's just pushing and pushing and pushing and pushing and pushing. And I just have to kind of wait for it to go away. And otherwise, I can't, I, I wish I could just like fucking stop. Eh, it's, it's cool. But no, um, it doesn't work like that. And I found myself in situations where uh, I've gotten in uh, like, serious shouting matches with people for just ridiculous things. Um, I mean, not just the usual like arguments on IRC, but like really serious, like, fuck you, buddy. I'm going to, I'll, and, and you just lose it. And then uh, like an hour later, you're just like, I feel like, like the, just the biggest complete asshole in the world. And I feel like I don't have any control over myself. Um, but that is, it's, it's just, it's really hard to deal with that when it, when it comes on. And it's, I don't, I'm getting better at it, but I don't have a ton of techniques for like, if I start feeling it come on. The other thing is like, especially if I feel like I'm angry about something and I'm getting pissed off about something, I think that really this person is doing something wrong and I need to do something about it, is that I don't feel like I should stop because I feel like I'm doing 
the right thing and I kind of feel justified and righteous about it. And I might be, but the problem is, is that I'm losing my shit in the process. And I am going, to, I'm going to, like, it, it, it goes to a completely unhealthy level um, where the biggest thing that I find is that where I don't care about consequences for my actions. Um, where it is irrelevant. It's irrelevant that like if I do this and I carry this out, I could screw things up not only for myself, like career-wise, or but also for my family too. Um, st stuff like that. Just not thinking. And, and but actually, I shouldn't say not thinking about it. I'm totally aware of it. I just don't give a shit at that point. I was like, fuck this. You know, I don't care. I don't care what happens. I don't care. And. When you get into that, that's just a really dangerous place to be in. Um, but that is, that's this feeling that like things that would bother some people to some extent seem to bother me a lot more. Particularly like if I'm dealing with people like, um, if I'm getting in an argument, particularly on the internet, um, and uh, who doesn't do that? Uh, and <laughs> so that, I've had a lot of trouble with that. I remember, uh, so let's tell you how old I am. Uh, it was like 1995, and I was on the Usenet group Rec Music Industrial, and I used to do a bunch of like old like underground music stuff and do music scenes and stuff like that. And I remember this guy who was just a he was running a record label, and he was just a fucking dickhead, and everybody knew he was a dickhead, and he was just like a fucking troll, and everybody else kind of just laughed at him. But I remember that this dude was I know mean, he got pissed off at me for some reason, and was giving me shit, and was like, "Man, I'm gonna kick your ass" or something like that, right? And I was really fucking stressed out, like I couldn't sleep level as stressed out about it. And, you know, on top, I had a similar experience to that with somebody in some other forum, and I talked to somebody else, and I was like, what, what should I do about this? And they were like, I don't know, just don't let it bother you. <laughs> like, eh, mm, didn't, I don't know, it didn't, that did not work. I've gotten better at deflecting that, and I don't know how much of that is, how, you know, as I've gotten older, my way my brain works has changed, or maybe I just have better techniques, I don't know. But that's, yeah. Uh, so anxiety uh, is, is, is kind of part of this emotion, but um, you know, it feels like I have more extreme anxiety or worried about stuff, but, or for no really ap apparent reason. Um, a lot of times it takes, I, it takes work for me to try to figure out what's bothering me. Um, because, oh, oh, everything seems to be going okay, what are you freaked out about? Oh wait, it's because in a week from now, this is gonna happen. And I'm freaked out about that. Um, I have these, you know, physical manifestations of that anxiety. Um, for me, right now, the stuff I've been dealing with the last few years, most commonly, what I get is I feel like I have a knot right at the base of my sternum, and um, when I start getting worried about something, that feels starts getting tighter and tighter. Like if you had a, like a big rope knot, and it was like turning it really tight, and there's just nothing I can do about it. There's things I can kind of try to do to relax like let my gut hang out or things like that. But uh, that is, that's, a, that's a tough one to deal with. Um, and uh, I used to have, and I, I think this was pretty closely related to it, I used to have IBS, you know what that is, irritable bowel syndrome. Um, so it's a fun thing to talk about. Um, uh, the, the, I guess the easiest way to put this is I was just afraid that if I was away from a bathroom for more than 10 minutes, I'd shit my pants. Um, so you can imagine how that kind of affects you in terms of travel or going anywhere or leaving the house uh, or taking a job where maybe they have like a key for the bathroom and there's only one key. Um, uh, so that was like, I'd be like, like if it was, uh, you know, I'll just take an hour drive, going to visit family or something like that. I'm white knuckling it. Like even before I'm in the car, I'm like, Jesus fuck. And I, I've had times where it's just I'm sweating. And of course, the, the thing that you get into that is you're worried about that. And physically, that worry tends to, for a lot of people, and me included, it tends to uh, manifest a lot in your guts. So uh, the more you feel like that, the more that your uh, colon starts like going, you know. Uh, so that's kind of not fun. Um, thankfully, I've kind of, through either, I don't know, calming down or... Uh, at taking some other things, like I take fiber supplements, that seems to help out with that a lot. Uh, that seems to have mostly passed because uh, there is no way in hell I could have traveled here from Indiana uh, if I was still had that problem. Just no way. Zero, it would be impossible for me to do it. Um, but the thing, there was a quote that a, a, a friend of mine said 
then I, I, when I was talking about giving this talk, I said, she said, I find the challenge to be explained to folks how it's not like their anxiety about a job interview or Mondays. Um, and that it's kind of a different level of like worry. It's, it's debilitating. And I guess that's, that's sort of this line for me is like, how does it really impact your ability to function and to make decent, clear-headed decisions? And for me, that's kind of the big difference, I guess. And that's, that's what I experience. Um, I have some problems focusing. I kind of talked about that. I, 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 a lot of times, like I said, when I was a kid in school, uh, I had a lot of trouble focusing on something I wasn't interested in, particularly if it took a little while. Um, like, uh, so I had a lot of trouble ever completing homework, and of course they're giving me, read 100 pages of Dostoevsky tonight. And I was like, that's not happening. You know, I usually never completed any of my reading assignments. Um, so stuff like that, and that, that definitely affected job stuff where it would be like, I would, I'd go for like a week or two and not get anything done. Um, I was good enough at doing those kinds of things that I could make up for it. And I would sort of have these spurts where I was very productive and then not less productive. And I still have that, but it's just not as extreme where it would be go on for as long a period. It's just not as bad as it used to be. Um, one of the things that I have is, people talk about this in different ways, but I feel like I have these sort of spiraling chains of thought um, where I will think about a potential situation coming up and I will think about a possible, particularly negative outcome from that. And then I will say, okay, well, what happens if that happens? And then, okay, well, then I might find myself, I don't know, stranded, you know, in an airport. And uh, what if I lose my wallet? And, says, and I will construct these, like, um, huge chains of, like, potential outcomes that will lead to eventually, um, this is just the end of the world, and I'm going to be fucked, and there's no way I can do this. Um, and I was, I struggled with that taking this trip out here. Um, the, particularly the last couple days before I took my flight on Tuesday, um, I started feeling nervous. And for me, it's not, it's not, I'm not nervous about flying. I'm nervous about um, going someplace and uh, not having the stuff I'm supposed to have. And then um, what am I going to do? Like, what if I get there and I forgot my power cable for my laptop, or what if I forgot my laptop, or what if my laptop gets stolen, or what if I lose my phone? I actually packed two extra phones in my suitcase <laughs> um, this time, usually just one, but I actually packed two separate phones. Um, so uh, that's, it, uh, the reason I do it is because of that. I'm afraid that, I, like, what if this goes wrong? I'm, I'm freaked out of the fact that I, because I got a damn iPhone 5 and they changed the connector, I've only got one of these stupid lightning cables. And I had like 25 of the other kind. And so 25, it was like, I just throw like, like a couple of them in the suitcase. I got them and everything. I got one in the bag. I got one, you know, they're all over the place. Now I've only got one. And this makes me nervous that I've only got one. Uh, because I'm afraid, well, what if I lose this? And then I won't be able to plug in. And yeah, of course, I it's a city. And sure, it's going to be fine. But I don't really know how to get around in this city. I know some, that's one thing that I'll talk about a little bit. But like some people go to conferences and like speak a lot. They're like, I love to travel. Let me just take a bus and, and explore the city. Stuff like that. And that sounds like a complete nightmare to me. <laughs> Why would anybody do that? Um, I, to me, it, I get freaked out, like, especially if I'm alone. If I have a buddy, I'm OK. But if I'm alone, like, I, I will go, like, if there's a bar. Like, I had this, like, I don't know, a few months ago. There was a little meetup of just some local folks at this bar. And I hadn't been to this bar before. And I knew my friends were in there. I didn't know exactly where. And I didn't know what the etiquette was for this bar, because different bars have different etiquette. And you're like, well, if you ask for this, maybe they'll think you're an asshole. Some you know, bars are like that. No, most aren't. And usually most people are humane. Uh, but sometimes they're not. And so I was literally just standing outside the bar. And I was at the point where I was like, fuck this. I'm just going to drive home. Because I couldn't handle the like, tension of like, oh my god, I have to go in here and I have to, I don't know what to do. And so, uh, but then a friend of mine who was inside texted me and said, hey, we're in here. And I was like, that was just enough where I was like, I felt like, oh, there's a human being I know there. And okay, all right, I pulled myself in. But I was literally just like, I was ready to just go home and just be like, oh, I just feel like You know, and of course, if I did that, I'd feel like a fucking idiot. I mean, I'd feel like, it, it, I'd feel like shit and like, 
well, I could have gone and done something fun. Because inevitably, whenever I push myself through those things, it's almost always fun. And it always turns out great. But I'm still freaked out about it because I feel like I don't know. I, don't, I guess it's like I, I don't know what the social etiquette is supposed to be. Um, I'm terrified of riding public transportation, particularly it, like I'm be, in places I've never been to because what I don't know what the currency is. Maybe they got some kind of system, right? I don't know. They got, like here they have cards. I'm only at this point, and I've, I've traveled to speak in Portland like seven times. I'm only now kind of like, I sort of get the max, sort of. I guess. And it's really easy. You just buy a ticket and ride around. They don't even check the tickets. I bought, every time I bought a ticket, I've never once had anybody ever check a ticket here. Really? Yeah. Okay, so all I've done is it's just come from the airport to here, right? And they're just, I don't give a shit about those guys. So, yeah, did you? Crazy. I know. My anxiety, it's all what I expected it to be. I knew it. Oh, well, see, so yeah, maybe this would count. Um, but yeah, do you have a question? Yeah. That's OK. No. Right. Yes. There's no rationalizing. Yes, exactly. There's no planning around it. Your mind is already in an irrational state. Right. I, it's, it's really like if, you, it's, if, if you've experienced this stuff, you've had people, I'm sure, tell you just like, just calm down. It's going to be all right. Yeah. Well, it, well, shit, if I could say that to myself, I wouldn't have a problem. <laughs> you know? But yes, exactly. It's not rational. And that's the, that's the frustrating thing is because... I, am a, I like to consider myself, I can kind of think things out a little bit and try to be pretty rational and pretty pragmatic. I appreciate that comment a lot. Um, I, I really, so it's particularly frustrating when I know what the logic of it is, but my brain will not allow me to act on that properly. And so that's very frustrating. Um, I tend to obsess on negative events. Uh, I am not as bad at this as it used to be. But I remember as a child, um, so I was in sixth or seventh grade, maybe late, even later, like in the high school or stuff like that. Uh, I remember one year, this was back in like, I remember in like third grade, we had a, some kind of spelling workbook that we had to fill out every day and turn in at the end of the year. Now, as we know now, I uh, had a lot of difficulty with focus and stuff like that. So I was smart enough, and I guess could like think quickly enough where most of the time, if it was just work to do in class, I could do that very easily. And I, I actually did very well in elementary school. But as soon as I started to have homework, I started doing really shitty in school. Um, but this was kind of like homework in third grade. And um, so I had this thing I had to take home. And I, didn't, I just didn't do it. And it was like I tried to do some of it. And it you're supposed to turn it at the end of the year. And it was like there were two days left. And I tried to do some of it. And I got turned in. And I don't know. I would think about that. Years later, as a, as a, as a child, as a, you know, high school and stuff like that, and just feel shitty about what had happened with that. And I was a fucking kid, you know? What, what's, the, what's the big deal? And I, I, but I, I, I still think about things like that, things where I feel like I let people down, or things where I feel like that was just a, some kind of you know, emotionally traumatic event, that um, I really I struggle with that, you know, um, about letting go of that. Um, uh, the other thing is, I have to kick this in a little bit, but unwanted thoughts are another thing I had to do. And I remember I used to have this problem a lot when I was a junior high, because for a couple of years, um, uh, I, I was raised Catholic, so we went to church every, 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 uh, every week. And uh, I, was, uh, I had this problem where I would think of something that was funny, and it really wasn't necessarily all that funny. Even then, I knew it was not that sophisticated. Um, but I, w I would want to start just like laughing out loud. And it, this was the worst time. You're not supposed to fucking laugh out loud, especially in a Catholic mass. Kick your ass out of there, right? You're supposed to, you know, sit and stand and kneel and say the words. And, that, you know, it's very, this is some kind of progressive 
Baptist shit. This is a, you know, you got to keep your ass down and shut up. Um, and uh, so just constant, like, so I would, I, now a couple things happened. One, I became terrified of being in situations where I was, uh, where I shouldn't say things, like where I, it wasn't okay for me to say laugh or kind of be funny or, or make a joke or something like that. So I was really scared, so I be, it became now very stressful for me. But and of course, at the same time, now my, my brain would constantly obsess over this. Um, uh, there's a good uh, podcast on a, a series called um, the Mental Illness Happy Hour podcast. Um, that's, and he has a lot of comedians on. The guy who does it, the host it, is a comedian. And one of the things that you learn is, is that I listen to a lot of like, comedy podcasts, and almost all of these comedians have, are suffering from mental illness of some degree, and that the, way, the reason why they're doing comedy is that they're coping with their mental illness. And, um, and uh, Maria Bamford, uh, who is a, a comedian, was talking about this, how she used to have these unwanted thoughts about, like, if she was in church, she was like, um, what if I just went up there and... Um, took a poop on the altar, and then like went around and cut up everybody and then ate them. Or, um, <laughs> she made a joke, I always thought this was kind of funny, she was like, she was like, like at the aquarium, she saw a starfish, and she was like, I, she just kept thinking about like, well, what if I just picked up the starfish and, and kissed it on its little poop hole, or something <laughs> like that, right? Um, I, I, I have a thing where I'm afraid of heights, but at the same time, I'm kind of obsessed with, like, if I'm on a balcony, I start thinking about, yeah, well, what if I jumped off? Why the fuck would you jump off? That's stupid. Especially you're afraid of heights, right? But I would think about that. Um, and it's hard to let alone. I think the hardest thing for me is, is it, it, a consequence of all this stuff is feeling like I'm alone or I'm not like anybody else. And I think that's the hardest thing. And that... Uh, has to do that. There's a lot of reasons for that, but I felt for a long time that um, basically I was made wrong, and that I'm broken, and I'm never going to be right, and I'm never going to be okay, and this is not going to work, and eventually I will probably end up dead. I mean, before like <laughs> just naturally dying. Um, I remember thinking about that. Uh, uh, my son uh, was not expected, and uh, it was, a, it was a, a big surprise. And I remember uh, after a couple months into it, uh, driving uh, in between towns to uh, visit his mom's family and thinking to myself, because I was just depressed all the time and so scared, and I just thought to myself that I did not believe that in the next year I'd be alive because I just didn't feel like I could cope with this. and I didn't know what to do about it. I felt like I was in an untenable situation. For a long time, uh, in, you know, in high school, I felt like, boy, everybody else seems to be able to handle this shit. Like they do better in class and stuff like that. And I can't. And what's wrong with me? And I felt like something was wrong with me and that I literally just didn't work the way that I was supposed to and I could not cope in society. Um, you know, and I, 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 I never, uh, I, I've had thoughts, I don't have as much as I used to. When I was younger I had a lot of suicidal thoughts, what they call suicidal ideation. Um, I haven't done it for a while, but I, this, this is actually for my cat, so, uh, but, <laughs> I, uh, yeah, I know, right? Um, but I still have scars. Here's a scar. There's a scar. You can't really see it anymore. The back of my hand, uh, I scraped off the skin with my fingernail by rubbing on it like that. When I was 13 years old, and I could still see the scar from that. I was 24 years old. Um, and it, it wasn't, I mean, mutilation like that isn't, and it, it's not an attempt to kill myself. I'm not going, like, this is going to kill myself. Uh, but it was really, I guess, in a way, it was like an attempt to get people to understand how I felt. And it was, I didn't know how to express it, and I didn't feel safe about expressing it. I, I just didn't know. I didn't know how to explain it to people. And I felt, this was like, how can I manifest this, I guess? It, didn't, it doesn't really make sense. But I know a lot of other people do this, too. So I, 
I mean, I, I never had as bad as people I've seen who have fucking scars up and down their arms and legs, and they just don't know what else to do. And I, I think that's what they're trying. I, I don't know. To me, it was me trying to express how I felt. Um, so real, for me, real suicidal actions are, have been very rare. Um, and they only really have happened in really intense sort of emotional situations. Um, I uh, had a, uh, I got in a big fight. Um, and we were a big shouting match fight. And I, I got in that situation where my emotion was so intense that I just did not give a shit about what happened and the consequences of what happened. And I've got a one-year-old and a wife I'm trying to work stuff out with, and um, I, 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 we're in this shouting match, and I go upstairs, and I just barricade myself in the bathroom, and I've got a mouthful of pills, like 30 fucking pills. Funny, I think they were probably the SSRIs. It's like, you kill yourself with that. Um, but I remember sitting there, I was sitting there, and I had that shit in my mouth, and really the only reason I stopped was because I thought about like what that would do to my son. And because that was the only thing. Otherwise, it was, I was like, fuck this. I'm out. I'm, I'm, I don't care. I'm done with this. And it's not getting any better. This is horrible. And I'm not going to be able to get out of this. And just, just fuck it. It doesn't matter anymore. Um, and I, I don't know. For me, I'm. <laughs> Believe me, don't have a kid to solve your problems. Um, <laughs> some people do that. Um, but, uh, or they think it's going, it's just not, no. But uh, it, it did help me in some sense that I had a sense of purpose that uh, if I let myself just fucking go to a shit, how's that going to affect him? And it was, that has been something that's probably kept me going for a while. I'm somewhat, I, I feel somewhat strongly that I would probably not be around if I, if I didn't have him because he stopped me from doing some really stupid shit. I mean, run, just taking my car and running it into a tree, stuff like that. Um, and I just didn't, I just didn't, I just couldn't do it to him. Um, obviously, it's going to affect a lot of people, not just, not, you know, not just him, but that's the thing that kept, has kept me stopping, um, and it's probably kept me trying to work on this stuff. So, as a developer, it's kind of interesting to deal with because, in some ways, there's actually some positives out of this. This is the worst transition ever. Um, but, uh, <laughs> but the issues that I have, well, it's just sort of the way that my brain functions, is I tend to be really good at pattern matching. Like, I tend to be good at and like kind of faster than other people are, it seems like. I am not a particularly good developer. I have almost, well, I have some formal training that I was very bad at uh, in college. Um, and uh, I, so I, I don't, you don't have a lot of, uh, I, I'm not particularly good at understanding, say, complex logic when it comes to computer science or things like that. But I'm good at like saying, okay, this is how we solve this problem. So how do, I can take that and I can apply this here. And then, um, so I'm good at that, like taking those patterns and applying those to other situations. I'm really good at that, and I tend to do that quickly. It seems like I'm able to do that a little bit faster than some other people. And then the other thing is that I'm really good at anticipating potential outcomes quickly. So like, I'm good at thinking about, you know, what if somebody uh, did this, like sent this data to our input? Are we, is this secure, like the way that we have this set up now? I'm really good at that. Kind of, it's kind of the same thing that says, you know, what's all the bad shit that could happen? Um, well, the bad shit could happen to me that freaks me out, but I can also anticipate, like, well, what if people interact with this system this way? What, you know, well, they might be, have a tendency to do that and kind of think about those things and anticipate those a little bit faster than some other people. Um, so that's helpful as a, as a web developer for me. Um, those things are helpful. Um, and those are things that could, I think help me work in a, in a number of different areas. So I've worked on you know, front end and back end stuff and, and, and database stuff and things like that. And I can kind of use those skills in a lot of places. And I think that's helpful. Um, I think the other thing it helps is that I think it helps me because I try to be an empathetic and a supportive colleague. And um, 
I think that that's really valuable, and not I, I've you know certainly been in situations where I didn't you know I didn't have those kind of people around me. So trying to be that kind of person for other folks who maybe are having difficulties or having issues or things like that, uh, I think is really strong. Uh, you know, just trying to be supportive, um, and I, I get a lot of reward personally from helping people. Uh, from like say, for me, one of the things I talk about you know, these stupid bios you write about yourself for. Uh, for doing conference stuff is that I really value empowering others through technology, which sounds is a, a bunch of horse shit, but I, I, I do, I really do. I, I like that because I like being able to say, hey, this person is wishes they could their job was a little bit easier, or wishes they could accomplish this task faster or something like that. It's like, oh, well, you know what? You could do this. Either I could build something for you or I can teach you how to do this. And I've empowered them in some way, and that is a really awesome feeling. And that's a big thing that I get out of doing this. Um, about, and so that's really rewarding for me. That's one of my biggest things that I get out of this. So that is a, a huge thing for me. Um, I think it's interesting sort of working with teams. I work on a fully remote team right now. Sometimes that is challenging um, in a couple different ways. Uh, I think you, I could do a whole session on like what, how it's different to work remotely as opposed to not. But I think one of the things you deal with is that oftentimes um, if you're doing stuff just via text, uh, my tendency is to interpret it in the most negative, worst possible way. Uh, so I tend to think that the person thinks I'm stupid and that they don't like something that I did or blah, blah, blah. Um, and I, you know, butted heads with some folks who maybe have more of a tendency to kind of come off as curt, um, uh, say via IRC or something like that. Um, it's really helpful to not just do all your communication that way. Try to touch base, like say via Skype or via like say a video chat, like Google Hangout or something like that. We try to do our stand-ups like that, and that's really helpful um, because it's like it's a human being. Hey, not just some, you know, angry word monster. Um, <laughs> Right? Um, so that's very helpful. How, many, how much time do I have? Jesus Christ. Um, I try to avoid working alone for a long period. For me, I tend to get, my mood tends to turn dark if I'm alone a lot. So even I have a nice, I mean, we got a new house, I got sun coming in, everything. I still feel like I just get anxious and I get grumpy and I don't like being alone. So what I do is even though I'm working remotely, I'll go out to a coffee shop and work in a coffee shop that, that works well for me. Um, it really, really helps to have managers and bosses who are understanding of your situation, who, that you could feel like you can trust enough that you can go talk to. And I've had to talk with many of my managers and or bosses and say, this is what's going on with me. I don't know if I can handle this situation that you've asked everybody else to do, and I don't know if I can do that because it's putting me, I'm, I'm really freaked out about it. Uh, and um, I've had generally good experiences with that. Um, but that is really key. So if you are in that kind of a role, I think trying to be really understanding is helpful. Um, I was thinking interacting with users, very quick, but basically users are sometimes your worst enemy, and a lot of times you're better off just ignoring everything. Like, let, let the support people handle that. If you're a support person, you're kind of fucked. But, um, <laughs> You picked the wrong job. Um, but, uh, you know, I used to do a, a, a relatively popular open source Twitter client called Spaz that I wrote. And uh, oftentimes that was very rewarding, the user feedback, and a lot of times it was not in any way. And it was, of course, the one or two little things that were negative were just ugh, so frustrating. Um, uh, IRC and forums. Um, I think it's the same kind of thing as that I tend to take things personally. That's really a struggle for me. Um, so it just is. And I think sometimes you have to think to yourself, do I even want to participate in this or not? Um, I have often thought to myself, it would have been better if I just didn't say anything and skip past it as hard as it is to do that, just to not engage. And it's not necessarily that uh, I'm endorsing what they're saying or not like that. And it's not even necessarily that person's fault, like they're doing anything wrong. It's for my health, my mental health. Um, conferences and community quickly. Um, I don't like loud parties with lots of alcohol. And at most developer conferences, people seem to get really excited about having loud, big parties with lots of alcohol. And it's not like I think you're a fool or, or there's something wrong with you if you enjoy those. I don't. I just don't enjoy that at all. I would rather sit down with just a few people and talk and have fun. 
in a small group. Um, I tend to find being around people a lot draining. So like I can kind of keep it up for a while, but then eventually I'm just like, I do not want to see anybody. I want to be alone for the next five hours. Um, and the other thing I talked about is travel is really scary for me. Um, I tend to worry a lot about, like, will I forget something and things like that. So, and because I'm in uh, Indiana, not a lot of developer conferences there, so I have to kind of travel everywhere for that kind of stuff. Um, I don't care what time it is. I'm going to give it a few more minutes. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about techniques that, that have helped some people. You know, um, I was going to say, but quickly, I think everybody self-medicates in some way. Um, I think a lot of people self-medicate with alcohol, and they deal with anxiety or things like that with alcohol. And maybe that works okay for them. They can drink every once in a while. It's not a big deal. You know, that's fine. Um, I think most of us, we use socially acceptable tools like food or drink or tobacco or things like that to regulate our mood in some way. And that is how people operate. And I think people generally, as far as I know, have operated like that for a very long time. And this is not, you know... Um, I tend to think that most people who use illegal drugs are self-medicating for some more severe um, mental health issue that they have. Um, I think the consequences are such that most people who get involved in it probably, if they were thinking about consequences clearly, would not have gotten involved with it. I th and I think that most people say who do those kinds of things are, like I said. Um, I tend to self-medicate with food. Um, I don't like... Uh, I, I take prescription drugs, but I don't like taking a lot of, say, just purely recreational stuff. Um, but I like food a lot, and that makes me happy. So um, I really like ice cream and hamburgers and things like that. And that stuff makes me really happy and makes me feel better. Um, that is not a good pattern, and I do not think that's healthy, but I do that. I'm very conscious of it. Um, a lot of people come to me and talk to me about... Um, what should they do? I've had a lot of people write me and, and uh, say they talk about some situation that they're going through or having difficulties with stuff, and they ask, like, what, well, what should I do? The first thing I tell them is I think you need to go talk to somebody, and I think you should talk to a therapist. I think a lot of people go and talk to their general practitioner or something like that and say, well, I've been kind of bummed out, um, something like that, and they, get, and they get prescribed a medication, and then they're kind of, all right, we'll see how it goes. And that's not really dealing with stuff. Um, there's nothing against general practitioners or anything like that, but they're not trained to deal with psychology and psychological issues. Um, I think that typically, in, in many or most cases, I think depression or anxiety is usually a symptom, really, of emotional or physical issues that you're having. And I think that you, it's really important to find somebody who you can work with or find a group of people that you can work with to figure out what the issues are for you and figure out what, wor you know, what works to kind of treat this stuff. How much of this is, say, emotional trauma from the past? How much of this is stuff that I'm going through right now? How much of this is just maybe the way my brain works? My brain kind of tends to work a certain way, and so that I think that I'm probably going to be taking some kind of medication for my whole life, I expect. But I also know that I've had emotional stuff that has contributed greatly to the issues that I've had, and certainly has contributed to say, issues of depression and anxiety. And... Um, I, I think there's a combination of that stuff, and I think it varies for everybody. I had somebody wrote me a long letter, and she had a, a ton of issues with depression. It started off as postpartum depression, um, and she wrote me and it said it turned out that for her, what helped was she got a treatment uh, for an issue that she had with her, her pituitary gland that they didn't discover for like 10 years, and that has helped her a ton. Now, I'm not, I would say that that is not a particularly common thing. I think most people have other you know, sources, but I think that that is, I, you know, that's not really talked about that much, but you certainly, it could be something like that. Like I said, I think it, it typically, there's something deeper going on, and you need to help with people who have expertise in this area to figure out what that is. So I take, you know, but I take medicine. I think medicine is a really useful tool. For some people, it's what they need to take. It's like insulin for a diabetic. Um, I kind of think that a lot of the stuff that I take, it's going to be like that for my whole life. Um, uh, but it doesn't have to be that way for a lot of people can work out stuff, you know, for, for whatever is going on. Uh, exercise helps me a lot, but I do it so infrequently. I know I should do it, but I don't. Um, some people meditate. I'm not a meditation person, and that's not going to work for me, but some people like it. Uh, some people, I know that I just get outside in the sun, and it helps me a lot, but light therapy helps with a lot of people. Some people have a, a condition called seasonal affective disorder. 
Um, then getting in under ultraviolet light seems to help them a lot with their mood. And just avoidance of triggers. Um, I uh, not infrequently will block certain uh, domains in my Etsy host file so that I can't look at them because I know I will tend to obsessively look at them and it'll make me very angry. And I don't want to be angry and I don't want to be anxious and frustrated because it's not helping anybody, particularly myself. Um, people are afraid to cry <laughs> a lot. Uh, crying helps me a lot. Um, a lot of dudes aren't really into crying. Um, but um, for me, anger is usually it's a reaction to fear and anxiety. And usually the thing, if it's really intense, the thing that, that where it breaks for me is, is in crying. And I often find that very therapeutic and relaxing. And it, it does, I don't know if it's releasing it. I don't know, endorphins or something. It feels, but it, it's, it can be very calming for me. And just finding things that, that give you some comfort and, and being okay with that. Like I tend to wear my hoodie and if I'm kind of in a stressed out mood, I'll put my hood up. Um, I listen to things like people talking about stuff that's not tech. <laughs> um, I tend to avoid it because a lot of times I don't want to think about it because I find that kind of stressful. Like I listen to podcasts, I don't listen to any tech podcasts <laughs> um, because I don't, I don't want to think about that right now. I, think, I listen to like comedy stuff or things about sports or stuff like that. Um, just talking to trusted people I think is really helpful. And I think people really are, un I think hugs are really underrated. And I, I, and, uh, I think that um, for me, that physical contact and that a lot of people with autistic spectrum disorders, some people find it that it helps them a lot. And I saw somebody who they created a machine that's essentially a big hugging machine that would help treat them. I don't know that I, I maybe have certain things that are a little bit like that. Uh, but it makes me feel a hell of a lot better when I feel that and I can kind of feel that just that pressure e even just and then the other thing is that Another human being sort of gets it and gives a shit and that's really good um, I'm gonna skip through I talked about some of this stuff. I uh, I think w when you're trying to help other folks Just help them feel safe listen to them understand what it's like for them Understand they're probably extremely frustrated with the situation and probably are very angry with themselves or feel very frustrated about the whole thing. Um, and understand that change is really, really hard for a lot of people in these kinds of situations. And you know, if, if change is happening, especially in a workplace or something like that, ask them how they feel, what they need, maybe do that one-on-one. -on -one. I think that stuff's gonna help a lot. So, all right, two things. This is a page of resources. All these slides are gonna be available. But there's a lot of good stuff here. Um, I wanna highlight two things. One, DevPress, which is a, um, a forum that a guy, I forgot his name, but he just emailed me. But it's basically, it's for people talking about mental illness specifically for developers, which I think is pretty cool. The other thing I wanted to highlight is that thing I talked about, the mental illness happy hour. It is one of the most, the stories that you'll hear on there and the people talking about stuff, it is extremely powerful, um, revealing, sometimes very, sometimes very, very hard to listen to. But um, the podcast and the forums that they've developed that they put out there are just really, really good. And I think it's a really awesome resource for people. So I'd encourage you to kind of check that out. Um, I've taken too much time already. So thanks, I appreciate it. Please feel free, just come up and talk to me.